All right, welcome to the next episode of the Security Champions Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Birch, and today I'm joined by Derek Fisher. Now, Derek Fisher has a long career in security, as well as starting out as developer and technical side of the house. Uh, he is an author of the Application Security Handbook. He's done a kids series on security and security awareness, as well as he does volunteer work and been in the organization and basically in the industry for a very long time, right? I think better than me listing off a bunch of accomplishes. How about, Derek, you tell us about your security journey that's brought you to where you are. Sure. Yeah, and Mike, thanks for having me on and really uh, looking forward to this conversation and appreciate, you know, you give me a, give me some time here to, to talk. So, um, so yeah, I, I started out in, in engineering, uh, pr pretty early on my, uh, my dad worked at Commodore computers for those that may remember that. So, uh, I had been surrounded by computers, uh, for most of my life and, um, even got my hands on some prototype stuff that never made the, you know, saw the light of day, but, uh, it always kept me interested in, in kind of the engineering, um, uh, world. And so I got into hardware mechanical engineering uh, early on um, and uh, spent a good decade in that in that uh, area. And it really gave me a good understanding of how technology gets built, uh, not just, you know, the software, but, you know, when we're talking about servers and 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 uh, hardware, I mean, that's that's where it starts. Right. Um, so eventually decided to pursue a, a degree in computer science. Uh, moved into uh, software engineering, which again gave me some good um, experience in how software it gets built and, and developed and, and designed, and that led me into security, which uh, to me was really appealing in a sense that we build these things, whether whether it's you know, and hardware is not any different, right? There's there's plenty of of hardware that's that's vulnerable as well, <clears throat> but you know, we build these things and <clears throat> the main focus of, of building these products is to deliver value to, to customers and clients. And that comes at a cost uh, for whether it's, whether we're talking about pure defects or whether we're talking about security vulnerabilities. But, you know, there's that saying that you can have it, uh, I'm gonna butcher it, but you know, you can have it cheap, fast, or, uh, you know, secure, uh, usually it's three, it's cheap, fast, and I forget what the third one is, but, um, you know, we can look at it, uh, cheap, fast and secure. And there's a constant trade off, you know, between how we get stuff out to our customers hands, uh, versus <clears throat> how we reduce risk for the organization. And so, you know, I really kind of fell into the security, um, uh, environment and, and really found a lot of passion for it. I, I pursued a degree in, in, cybersecurity, uh, master's degree, got into security architecture. Um, actually my start <clears throat> was a security champion, um, for the, the product that I was developing in. And so that's where I kind of got started, got into security architecture, eventually started leading teams in application security, and then started building programs, uh, around application and product security. So that's what I'm doing right now. I've been in multiple different, uh, uh, verticals and industries as far as military. I, <clears throat> when I was in my hardware days, I, I worked in uh, the military space uh, as a you know military contracting company. Uh, I've worked in commercial space. I've worked in healthcare. I've worked in financials. Um, and so I I think you know I've been able to see a lot of different um, areas of where the pain points are for different industries and different companies. Uh, because obviously a financial company is going to have a much different uh, risk profile than a healthcare company and, and different budgets and different technology. And, and I think that makes it more interesting from a security point of view of how do we secure that, right? Because, you know, it's like, it's like being on a uh, island in one of those survivor shows where it's like you're washed up on a shore somewhere and you're, you got a backpack and you open it up and you might have matches in there or you might have two sticks you got to rub together. You know? And it really depends on which you know, which industry you're in and, and what, you know, what their budget is and what their risk profile is and all that and how much they're actually spending on, on security. So it's a challenging space to work in. And, and I, I find that interesting. So I also teach at Temple University, um, which has been a, I, I've been doing that for, I guess, five, six years at this point. And um, it continues to be a very popular course. Um, and I find that it's good to see that 
universities are taking that more seriously in the sense that they're offering these security courses so that the individuals that were that the universities are turning out in terms of uh, developers and software engineers and, and just technologists that we're also trying to equip them with at least fundamental knowledge around security. Um, because, you know, we all know that we can't, you can't hire enough security people to secure an organization. You know, you have to be able to equip everybody around you um, to at least have an appreciation for security and at least know what to look for um, and do their best <laughs> to not, you know, create new vulnerabilities. But, um, but that's, you know, I, I think it's good to see that there's interest um, in learning those skills at the university level. And the course is pretty popular. So, it, which is, it's no, no, it's no testament to me, I, because it, apparently, you know, it, it's, um, I'm an easy, uh, maybe it is because it's an easy course and, and, you know, or that I'm an easy uh, teacher, but, you know, for me, I, I think it's more, um, indicative of the fact that I think a lot of people are trying to get those skills, uh, getting out into, into the technology space. And I often try to pitch that too to the students by telling them that, Hey, this is going to set you apart, right? You know, you're not going to come out of this course being a hacker. You're not going to come out of this course being a security uh, architect, but you know, you're going to have a better understanding of security and you can take that into your, you know, your first job or, or, you know, into, into an interview and be able to talk about security because it's becoming more, not a requirement, but it's, we're starting to see that more people, more organizations are asking for those security uh, fundamentals from, from their development teams. So, so I said a lot there, so I apologize, but <laughs> that's, that's me in a nutshell. You know, I think, uh, I think this is the best analogy I've ever heard to really capture the way we feel as security people is that survival situation. We're coming in and we got a few tools that we come open in a bag, no idea what we're going to get. And we just got to make it work so our company can live. Like, I think that yeah. really captures the sentiment of most of us walking into organization currently. Uh, yeah. The education part I love. I love the education part of it and I, I'm biased because that's that's what I do, right? I'm all about teaching security. Um, what really brought you into have that kind of passion to want to teach? Because you do it in a couple places, not just the education, but you, you do it through your writing, right? And you're targeting a lot of different groups there. Yeah, it's funny because when I was in high school, I, you know, again, I, I've been around technology all my life and I, I think the, the, the die was cast, but um but for a while there, I, I wanted to be a history teacher because the other the other part of me is that I, I love, you know, when I'm not reading technology books, I'm usually reading some kind of historical fiction or nonfiction. And um, so, I you know, I'm very intrigued by history. And so <clears throat> so my, you know, in high school, when when you got asked, like, what are you going to be when you grow up uh, or, you know, middle school was uh, I'm going to be a history teacher. So <laughs> I think I, I think I always enjoyed that kind of, you know, that the idea of, of giving back. And so, um, and I think even in, in security, we, we almost have a, an obligation to, to give back to, to the community, what we're learning, because I think that perception that security is in the ivory tower, just, you know, uh, uh, creating these uh, policies and, and standards and, and, you know, just telling everybody what they shouldn't be doing, um, I think those days are gone, right? I, good, you know, it's good that they're gone because that, that's not how we, you know, should should approach security, at least from, you know, at least from the space that I've been in, in terms of secure engineering, where you can't get you can't get things done by sitting in the ivory tower and just saying, hey, like here, you, you guys, here's a scan report that we did, and, and all your, you know, your software is crap, and here's all the vulnerabilities, that doesn't get you any, you know, it's not going to get you anywhere, right? I, I think our our role is really to be engaged as much as possible with the people that we're working with. So, um, so to me, getting in the temple was honestly never even thought about it. Never. It, it just happened to be that I knew somebody that was, um, that was already teaching there. Uh, he was teaching in quality assurance class and he said, Hey, once, once a semester I have, you know, I'd want to bring somebody in to, to talk about security to the QA students. And uh, kind of morphed from there. Uh, so for maybe a couple of semesters, I, I just went in once a semester to talk to the students about, you know, security. Um, and then it eventually led to like, hey, would you, would you consider doing a course? And it's like, yeah, I 
I guess. <laughs> so never thought about it. So I guess so. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it, it's, it's been great. It's definitely, it's helped me, uh, really hone the message of what application security and, and software security is. Um, and, you know, not to make it simplified, but really boil it down to like, what's important, what's important for, for these students to come out of this course understanding. Um, so I think that's been, you know, all beneficial to, to, uh, you know, the students and, and myself in terms of uh, really boiling down software security into something that's, that can be consumable. And I think that really hits on something that's a, uh, it's a huge gap in our, in our industry right now, especially when you think of the developer pipeline, security is not a requirement like to graduate any computer science course, anywhere that I know of, you can take an elective, right? You can specialize in yep. security and they'll let you as an add on. Um, but that's like, to me, it's like the same as saying, okay, let's make algorithms an add on. You don't have to take algorithms past. That doesn't make sense, right? right? You need right. algorithms. You need to know those concepts to be able to write software. You need security to write secure software. It should be a requirement, right? If we're going to have right. you build it, you got to build it right anyway. So until, until we have that full shift where it becomes that, that a requirement for the pipeline, we're still going to have kind of this gap, right? When the people right. that were producing our software. Yeah. Now, one of the other things that um, you've written that we're going to definitely be touching on um, is the Application Security Program Handbook. Um, I actually took some time to read this recently. Love this book. This isn't me doing a sales pitch for anybody listening. So it's going to be a raw opinion here real quick. One of the best books about running an application security program I've read, read in a long time. And the reason I say that and the reason I'm, I enjoyed it so much is you were very down to earth on kind of your approaches to a lot of the problems and you definitely didn't have that well this is the security way we should do stuff so we're going to die on the hill of this perspective no matter what you definitely took some time to look at that perspective of the development team's needs and meeting those needs while supporting what we're trying to accomplish in that uh, program so before we dive into the book itself I kind of wonder what was the inspiration and that brought you to say you wanted to write this book and kind of put this out in the community you know, I think it, it came down to uh, there was an alignment of stars. And I, I think what happened was that I had been in the middle of uh, um, building a, a product security team, an application security team at, at the organization I was at. And, you know, I, I, I kept saying, like, man, I should write this down because like or at least like put together, like, here's the framework or here's the, you know, the model. Um, and, you know, continue to build on that as I'm, as I'm, uh, you know, building this program. And <clears throat> it just so happened that Manning Publishing called me literally weeks after that thought popped in my head and said, Hey, have you ever thought about writing a book? I was like, yeah, sort of. <laughs> what are you guys thinking about? And, you know, Manning does a lot more technical, uh, books, you know, in, in terms of, uh, development. And so trying to pitch the idea to them that like, what I'm thinking about is application, you know, building an application security program. It's not, you know, there's, there's going to be some hands-on efforts and work within it in terms of risk, you know, risk rating and threat modeling and, and that kind of stuff. But, but fundamentally I, I wanted to write down for those that come into an organization and are, are given the, uh, the mandate to build a, an application security program to give them something to, to lean on. Uh, because that's what I was asked when I went into the organization I did said, build an application security program. So, okay. <laughs> you know, um, so I, I think there is, I think I don't, I don't, and I believe I even wrote this in the book. I, I, I don't believe I'm breaking new ground on, on what, you know, I put in the book. There may have been some, you know, novel ideas in there. Um, but for the most part, I think what was missing is, is putting that map together of, here's you know day one you come into this organization somebody's asking you to build an appsec program what do you do um and so I, I i hope that that's you know beneficial to some people that as they are tasked with doing something like that that they they can lean on this book to get you know pieces you know to see the full map of how to do that but i also think that there are you can take it in bite sizes as well like if you want to dive in on it on a specific topic i i hope that there's enough uh, in there that, you know, somebody would be able to just take a, a specific topic out and, um, and be able to run with it based on, on what I wrote in there. So, so it wasn't like, you know, 
wasn't totally intentional, but it, it, I'm glad it worked out. Um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm overwhelmed by the, you know, the, the reception that I have gotten on, on the book so far. And I'm glad that people are finding value in it. Yeah, I definitely highly recommend anyone that's running AppSec program, take a moment, check this book out. It has a, it has a lot of good information. It's exactly what you said. Like, I don't necessarily think I went through, I'm like, oh, I know what SAS and DAS is, right? I know how these things work. But the comparisons co that you use them in context around everything else, that's the parts that I think people start missing, right? Is the context you gave around how to use these different tools and techniques in comparison to everything else that's out there. Um, so that's actually good. now a good intro and a good break point. I'm going to give a 30 second break for our sponsors to say a few words, and then we're going to jump back in this conversation, have a little bit more of an in-depth conversation about application security programs and even more so security champion programs. Awareness programs don't provide enough in-depth learning. Ensure your technical teams are getting the knowledge they need to build safer software. Security Journey provides hands-on secure coding training in an application sandbox that allows developers to identify, break, and fix common security vulnerabilities. Give your developers the opportunity to recognize and prevent common and emerging security issues before they become a problem. Visit securityjourney.com to try our training today. All right, welcome back to the Security Champions podcast. I'm here with Derek Fisher. We're going to be talking about the security or the application security guide and security champion programs. So first question I have, love the book, read a lot into it. One of the things that you bring up that I think it's really important for us to embrace in community is that there is a gap right now, and there has been for a long time between security and development. I think that's inherent because our priorities are just not the same, right? Engineering, we wanna get product out. Security, we wanna make sure it's safe when we do so. Now and then we have confliction when we try to do this properly. So. For our listeners out there, what's some of the guidance you might give to them about talking about bridging that gap between development and security? You know, I, I think the the conflict comes from the fact that I, well, I shouldn't say the fact because this isn't true everywhere, but I do I believe that the the conflict comes from engaging security too late. And if you you know if you bring in uh, a security architect or you know a security engineer uh, or or let's just Let's just take the example of, of scan, you know, using a scanning tool to, to scan your software. If you're not doing that until later in your development cycle, then yeah, it's going to cause conflict um, because now you're up against a, a hard deadline. You got the the product owners, you know, beating down the door, asking you, you know, to meet a deliverable, um, and suddenly security comes in and says, "Well, you know, you have critical findings that we can't let out go out the door." Now again, that. You know, I'm simplifying it. I, I think there's shades of that throughout most organizations where you're not waiting until the last moment, um, but you're also not incorporating security as early as possible in your in your life cycle. And that's where I think the conflicts, you know, come up. So what I've always kind of viewed application security as is it's a it's a relationship, um, you know, it's a relationship uh, building business. Um, when I look at the other peer teams that are are in the security, you know, in a, in a large security organization or a small security security organization, they it's not that they don't it's not that they're not focused on the relationships, but their position is either to you know if you look at a SOC team or or a network security team or um, you know any kind of security team that is is directed to protect the organization, they're and when I mean protect, I mean protect the outer shell, right? You know, the, the network, the endpoints, you know, um, that kind of stuff. They're they're focused more on IT, IT security. Get get the tools out, get them implemented. You know, get our monitoring in place, get our uh, response plans, you know, tightened up. And that can be done kind of independent of of the end user, right? It's we're you know we're just going to deploy this you know endpoint protection to your machine, and and that's it. You don't have a say in it. Um, you know, with, with things like information security or GRC, they're more focused on the, those client engagements and dealing with the clients and, and they have to have those relationships with the clients, but they may interpret that back and just say, here's what the client wants, go do it. And you have two months to do it, you know, <laughs> uh, no negotiation. Um, I think in the application security space, you have a little bit, you have to have a different, um, mindset and mentality because if you're not partnering with that engineering team, you're not going to get things done. And you, you almost, the way I always kind of frame it is that 
application security is, is the sidecar to development. And, you know, we should be riding along with the engineers um, as they're building that software to ensure that, like, we're not we're not there to say no. We're, we're there to say, here's here's the, you know, the appropriate way to do it. And, you know, what I've really found is is that my team and, you know, the, the application security individuals that, that I've worked with, we're not always the ones coming up with the best solution. What I've often found is that, you know, having that conversation, having that relationship with the engineering team means that you're working together to come up with that solution. Because to be honest, like we're not, the security teams have to be able to not just know security, but know the full technical stack that the engineers are developing their software on. That's not possible. <laughs> you know, you, you can, you may be able to know, uh, you know, enough to be dangerous, but especially if you work in an organization that has .NET stacks, has Java stacks, has um, Node stacks, you're not going to know all of those languages and all the nuances and, and the exact, you know, way to solve the problem in four different languages. I mean, that's just, you know, it's not, it, not saying it's impossible, <laughs> but it's not it's not a common uh, finding in, in you know the application security space. So, so I think having that having that um, you know that relationship with the engineering team and being able to say like, hey, look, here's here's what we need to get to, right? We need to have uh, you know just as an example, we need to implement you know as much least we have to implement least privilege, right? You know, here's here's some thoughts around how we can do that. Um, and bounce those ideas off the engineering team. They're going to come back and say, well, you know, here's my thoughts, here's our thoughts, you know, and, and then you, it, with that relationship, you're able to come to a, a design that's going to, to satisfy both security and get, you know, things done at the right time. So, so I think that's the, the, the biggest thing that I, uh, you know, that I think anybody can take away from an application security uh, position is, is those relationships. They have to exist. They have to be good um, and they, they can't be adversarial. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I think one of the interesting parts is we have this heavy delineation that security jobs, security developments is development. Um, one of the things actually at uh, the uh, talks I do and my listeners, I've brought this up a couple of times in the podcast. They're going to probably get tired of me saying it, but I'm going to say it and I'm going to say it and I'm going to say it again. Um, developers are the largest part of our security organization. We just don't haven't accepted that yet. And until we accept that, we're going to have troubles, right? Because me as a security person, I'm not writing authentication. I'm not writing the input validation, in the application, the engineers are doing that. They're implementing all of the security controls we talked about. My job is more like, I don't know, a teacher. I'm there just to make sure it got done and did right. I'm there to validate. I'm there to grade and like, Hey, this looks great. Awesome. But they're the ones doing the work. So to be honest, they do way more security work than I think I do in a given day. Um, if we're doing things yep. right. <laughs> One of the things you kind of touched on is kind of that house of no. And it's another interesting thing you bring up in the book is the fact that a lot of times we're seen as barrier makers, right? But you you shift that conversation to be rail guards instead of barrier makers. Can you kind of explain what you mean by that? Yeah, I, I think it comes down to making sure that engineers, you know, developers have the ability to to deliver that code in a way that they feel confident that it's secure. And this honestly isn't much different than the way that we have the different guardrails in place to make sure that there's quality built into the into the development. So, you know, you have unit tests, you have system tests, you have integration tests, and those are all those are all there to ensure that defects are caught as quickly as possible and, and that the engineer or the development team is able to to fix those and get them out, you know, back out the door as soon as possible. And so the the concept isn't really, you know, unknown or foreign. Um, it exists and we have we have these paved road or paved roads or, or guardrails uh, in existence, um, you know, even from a security standpoint uh, in, in organizations where, you know, you make sure that uh, you have uh, your pipeline has the, the, the appropriate scanning tools built in at the right times and a, and a feedback loop back to the, to the development team to say, hey, here's where we found vulnerabilities. It's not going to clear, you know, a gate with with you know, a certain, uh, either a certain number or a certain um, uh, level, whether it's critical high uh, vulnerabilities, you know, it full stop. Um, and then in terms of being able to deploy it to say like a cloud uh, environment where you have your uh, your Terraform, your your infrastructure's code um, in, in such a way that you, you know, have it developed in such a way that it um, ensures that you don't have things like configuration drift or that the, in, the environment is, um, 
uh, developed or uh, created in such a way that it follows best practices and patterns and nobody's allowed to tamper with that. So I think, you know, there's there's ways that we can build the that paved road, that, that those guardrails to ensure that developers are just focusing on, you know, making sure that uh, their code gets out the door on time. And, it, and I had a conversation with somebody uh, earlier this week about how I think a lot of the reason why we are moving to that type of model is that we've really commoditized software in the sense that, you know, when I started out in engineering, uh, a product would take six months, nine months, sometimes a, a year to go from inception to production. Um, and that's because you had all these different, you know, iterations on it, uh, iterations on testing and, and, you know, back to the drawing board and, and you're, you're making, you know, incremental changes here and there. And then finally the product's done and, and it gets into customers' hands within a year. Um, that's not the reality anymore. Uh, we, we've made it to, we've gotten to a point now where, where some companies are, are releasing code multiple times a day. And if you don't have that ability to give developers the confidence to build that software in a, in, you know, multiple times a day and get it out into a production environment where they're not concerned about the security. If we're not, if we're not meeting them there, then we're, we're doing a, a disservice, not just, not just the development teams, but I think to the organization. I think this kind of is a good segue into like the champions program for me, right? So we're talking about the engagement, we're, we're paying this path, making it as easy as possible. I'm, I'm a highly believer in that. And then one of the things I think that um, I hear a lot from different people and people out in the world in security is they try to say, hey, developers are lazy, that type of terminology. And that immediately makes me cringe. I'm like, I don't believe that. A guy who, someone, or anyone who goes out and spends the time to get a master's degree in computer science, goes out and build software to solve problems, probably was in a lazy yeah. person. If you're saying your developer's lazy, it's probably because you're doing something that's impeding their workflow in a way that they don't want to interact with you right. or work with you on it, right? It's about making security easy for the customer. I think that's our job, right? Our job as security people is I'm there to make it as easy as possible for you to integrate security into your workflow. And if, the, if I can do that, I'm doing my job correctly. But then engaging engineers to be part of our security organization really leads into champion programs. It's a way, or, and people call it different type of things, but it's a way that we're trying to almost adopt them to be part of our community and much more integrated. What are some of your viewpoints on the successes and failures and kind of how we should be leveraging these, this concept of security champions in our organization? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a, you know, it's a tough one because I, I've, I've pushed for champions programs. I've built programs or champions programs. I've, I've been in a champions program. Um, it's the worst idea we ever came up with, but the best idea we've ever came up, you know, it, it's, it, what's that saying from uh, Churchill democracy is like the best, uh, or it's like the worst, but it's better than everything else, you know, or something like that. But it, you know, it's, um, I, I think there's, I think there's challenges with the champions group and, and, perhaps some of the challenges that we have with champions groups is that we try to formalize it. And the reality is that the people that get chosen for chosen or voluntold or, you know, volunteer for, for the champions position, it's not like they get hired. It's not like they got hired to be a champion. They were there the whole time, right? They were in those development teams, those engineering teams, uh, the entire time, uh, with that security mindset. And so, um, I think where the where the challenges get in is that you know when we formalize it and we and we build a bureaucracy around it and we have these expectations around it that sometimes maybe it loses its um, I don't want to say it loses its impact but it becomes more of a um, more of a an add on to that individual's role as opposed to what they were doing previously where it was like they were security minded people um, that you know, are there on the ground level, because that's the whole point of, of the champions team. And, and I trust me, I firmly believe in, in, in having, you know, a champions uh, type of program. But those individuals are there, right, to to be on the ground level, to look at those uh, JIRAs that are being uh, moved across the board as as something's getting ready to go out, out the door and, and being involved with those um those code reviews and and being involved with the design decisions to make sure that security is, is being thought about, you know, along those processes. So I think that, you know, again, 
they were there right before they became, you know, a champion and became part of this program of, of champions where then we start having expectations like, OK, you got to spend 10 percent of your time or 5 percent of your time doing security work. Um, you know, that that sometimes maybe puts people off about the champions program. And I think that's where you see the failures in the sense that it becomes more of a, a job as opposed to um, as opposed to, uh, you know, a position where you're where you're doing honestly the right thing. On the other side of that, though, you you have to have kind of that. You sort of have to put that structure around it because you want the, from a security perspective or from the security organization's perspective, the champions team is there to push their deputies. Right. And that's the way I've always kind of uh, pitched it as well as they're they've been deputized security, you know, uh, people and and they're supposed to take what it is that the security organization is is developing in terms of pro, uh, policy and processes and, and procedures and go evangelize that throughout their where their you know uh, area of operation is and so you you need that centralization to say okay here's you know and you want to solicit that feedback from the champions as well to come in to the to the central you know uh, organization or security organization to come up with those policies and procedures and and um, and you know push that back out into the into the federated uh, you know uh, silos of of the champions so you know, to me, it's it's kind of you have to have the will to want to do it, you know, from an organization perspective and not just do it in name. And I think that's kind of where uh, things, you know, fail is where or the champions program fails is when we try to, you know, mandate it without any real, um, you know, without any real buy in, you know, from the top where it's just like, yeah, we got a champions program and, uh, you know, People are supposed to spend five percent of their time doing champions work, and it's like, okay, what does that really mean? Like, are you really, are you really moving the needle? Are these people really engaged? Are they really? Um, can you prove that there's an effectiveness of of having that uh, champion within your uh, scrum team or within the, that product area? Um, are you seeing like you know better results because they're there, um, or is it that you you're checking a box by saying you have a a, a champions team and and you have a, a weekly meeting where everyone gets into a room and, and, you know, it doesn't really contribute. So it's, it's tough. Um, you know, I, I think many people that have had, you know, that are, are building those champions team, um, or have been running one for a while, um, face similar challenges. I, to be honest, I, I haven't heard of that many organizations that have had very successful, like ones that they're super proud of that, like we have this awesome champions team, um, you know, Usually when they're saying that it's, it's brand new, <laughs> you know, like if you check back in a couple of years, it's like, ah, yeah, we, we used to have a champions team. <laughs> so maybe I'm a little down on it, but I, you know, that's just kind of my, my opinion on it. You know, I, I, I like that because one of the things, and I'll even step on my own feet a little bit. And as, as the host of the security champions podcast, I, I like to kind of throw that out there too. Well, my viewpoint isn't necessarily always that security champion programs are the way to solve all problems. It's having people that champion yep. security yep. in your organization that solves the problem, right? So high clarity on, on what kind of the premise of the idea there. But, but leading into that, I feel that sometimes that we use some of these type of programs as band-aids to solve the real problem, but we're not putting right. it in the right place. Right. And maybe some of that might be even it's kind of my I have a high, high, actually anti SAS DAS tool kind of premise. A lot of people talk to me about like, hey, where are you spending your, your money and your time and your efforts and creating software? And like, oh, we got a great SCA tool, put a, got this brand new SAS tool, integrated my DAS tool last week, got a perfect pipeline running. Right. I'm like, that's great. You've built a lot of safety nets. I asked you what you right. were doing about security. I didn't ask you how you were catching the right. things you got wrong, right? Because that's what those are to me. To me, those are they're reactionary. I'm catching it. Everything else that we that apparently died before it got there, and we, right. then we fixed it at the end, right? But I, I think you know, to to your point, I think you know the the, the champions. They're it, it's more about evangelizing security within the product, right? And and you know that that's the important part. And, and same thing with what you're saying about SAS, you know, and, and my mind started going to, you know, when you have these scanning tools, 
you know, great. You implemented these scanning tools. Now you're getting hundreds of vulnerabilities. What are you doing about them? You know, and, and it's like it's the same kind of question uh, about the champion team. Like, what value are you getting out of that champion team? If you're doing it just because you say you have a champion team, well, that's not going to do you any good. Um, but if you have people that are truly passionate about security and they're truly passionate about building security into that product, then you have you have something that's a little bit more um, usable and, and something that you can hopefully see the, the benefits from. Yeah, and I agree with that. And I think that right now. Like we have to have these things, right? I I would never go to an organization and yeah. say remove all your scanning tools. Uh, like that, that that's never an approach it would take. But it goes back to like that source of the problem, right? And I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier in like baseline education, right? Security is not a requirement right. for engineering. Right. It's an add-on, right? And until we can shift that in our entire culture as across all our industries, we're always going to be having to focus on these safety nets because the champions program is only necessary because we don't have everyone already right. champion security across the team, right? We're having to create them because they're not right. natively already there. So, I mean, from your perspective, kind of until colleges basically adopt the fact that you need to have security programs, is security champions the best way to kind of engage them or there's some other stuff that we could be doing? You know, I, I think there's, there is, I think general education, uh, in the, in the business for security, um, you know, and that, and that can take many different, uh, flavors. I mean, if you push for just, um, you know, a, a, a purpose built training platform for security within an organization, great. Uh, if you use that for, for building your champions team, great. Um, but even if you take your, your heavy hitters on in your product, uh, development area and send them to conferences, you know, send them to, uh, B sides or, or, you know, not so much the bigger conferences because, you know, you're, you're going to see some stuff there, but not as good as, uh, the more, uh, technical, uh, security conferences where I think they'll get the value from. But I, I, we spend a lot of time trying to, and I mean, when I say we, I mean, you know, org engineering organizations, we spend a lot of time making sure that developers are up, up to date on the, on the latest technology stacks and, and that they, you know, are up to date on the latest languages and, and they can, uh, you know, they're full stack and they, they do all this stuff, but, um, but we're not giving them the space to learn about security. And again, it could be a purpose built training platform. It could be, you know, making sure that uh, you, you tied it as, as leaders uh, tied into their goals for the year. Like, Hey, what are you, are you learning anything about security this year? Maybe we need to look at um, some education or some conferences, things like that. So, um, but that helps kind of, because again, we can't, you know, champion team is great, but until, until everyone, um, every developer has a, uh, appreciation for security, you're still relying on on fewer people to uh, to take on a, a, a growing challenge um, because the, the the challenge isn't getting smaller year by year; it's getting bigger, and we're not we're not hiring enough to to you know to get out of that challenge. So, I think you know, it, arming the arming your your developers in the sense of, of security is is you know is the in my opinion, the best approach. Yeah, and I'd love to call out any of our guests who's never been to a B-Sides conference. They're great. And for the one reason I love them exactly what you call it out, they're not RSA, Black Hat, a lot of these other big name conferences. You have a lot of professional speakers talking about tech. At B-Sides, you have a lot of technical people talking about tech, right? So it's not necessarily the person who's the best speaker and presenter, but what they have to say at those conferences have a lot of weight and meaning, and they're definitely worth getting out to if you get a chance to go check them out. Um, yeah, huge fan of B-Sides. Um, other thing on that, and kind of along that same like thought process of education, analyzing, supporting our champions programs, one of the things that we, I, I definitely think is it's a huge uh, a shift is a lot of the governments, right? A lot of the, the regulation stuff is now is now identifying that as kind of a need. Like they're starting to push organizations to say, hey, you are now responsible to make sure that your developers have security education. Um, any thoughts on how that's going to kind of impact either a hiring processes or even internal basically requirements for training processes? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that'd be interesting to see how that goes because, you know, it's it's 
it's going to be um, it, it's going to be a question of okay, what did, what does that mean? How does that get implemented? Um, and I think that to your point, you know, is is that something that uh, again organizations are going to start asking in the hiring process, um, which again goes back to the point you made about universities and colleges, like what are they doing about it? So I think there's going to be a ripple effect um, in the sense that at least, you know, we recognize that there's a problem, right? That's step one, <laughs> recognize that you have a problem. Um, so that's good. But I think that it's going to be in the implementation. You know, it, does that mean that now universities are, are going to make that a required part of their curriculum for any CS, CIS, you know, any kind of technologist type of position that you have a base understanding of, of just security principles, you know, and, um, you know, in the class that I teach at, at Temple uh, University, you know, I, there's like, there really comes down to a handful of things that I, I usually say during the course, like if you take nothing away from this course, understand this, right, you know, um, and it's simple things, the CIA, right, uh, confidentiality, integrity, availability, right, that um, authentication, authorization, like just those basic principles, like understanding those are, are going to take you a long way. And then from there, you know, you build your knowledge around those things, because honestly, most things in security boil down to those, you know, those principles. So, um, so I think, you know, having to, to what you said earlier about that, that develop, you know, that pipeline of, of developers coming out of universities, Getting into that pipeline, uh, a mandatory uh, security uh, training uh, or course that's part of any computer science or, or technologist uh, um, curriculum, I think, is is going to push us in the right way. But organizations are, you know, going to have to uh, shift as well to provide that training to their to their staff as well, because, you know, the other kind of side of that is that we're now asking about you know, as an industry or, or as um, just, you know, globally, I think, too, primarily in the U.S., but, you know, do we still require that four-year degree, you know, especially in in technology type of, of roles? Um, yes, there's there are, you know, um, positions that absolutely you want to have somebody that has a four-year degree. Um, you don't want your neurosurgeon to, you know, be somebody that never went to learn about, you know, how to handle a scalpel. <laughs> um, but, you know, for technologists, I mean, there's no, there's tradition, there's, there's not really a, a traditional way to get into that. I, I mean, there is, but it, you know, some of the best engineers that, that you, you know, may have known may, may have never gone to college. Um, and so organizations are still going to have to be able to, uh, handle that, you know, that potential outlier where they're hiring people that have never seen a college campus, um, but are yet way more qualified than the last 15 people you hired that did have a college education. Um, so how do you make sure that that person uh, has has access to the to the security training? Yeah, and you call it a great point, and something I didn't even really think about because one of the one of my favorite engineers on our team went through a coding boot camp. He's great. Never went and got his degree. The guy was actually a personal. He was a chef before. He was like a sous chef before he went in, and then he wanted he wanted to get into tech. Went to coding boot camp. Started working here as an engineer. He's an amazing engineer, yep. right? But then once again, if we're the then the solution can't be necessary for this space just looking at the colleges, right? The responsibility has to be in the organizations, I feel, to make sure that A, they have the foundation, but they, they, B, they maintain right. it. We as security people are super used to having to do CPEs, right? right? I got to do CP X, Y, and Z for every cert under the sun, and everyone, you can't use one for the other, right? right? You got to, everyone specialize for their own stuff, right? But it's important for us because we do have to stay current and we do have to keep learning if we want to stay on top of it. That That's kind of almost the approach I feel like we should take across organization for people building our software. It shouldn't just be our responsibility to know security for our product. We should be pushing everyone to have to con continue that learning, continue that process because the threat landscape changes. Now, I have a huge, huge opinion that it doesn't change as much as people might say it does. But it does yeah. change, right? So maybe the techniques around it might be different. Well, I, and I actually, uh, and I, I call this out in my book as well, is that um, I, I think it's also important for security to be trained on on development. Um, because I think, you know, we, I mean, we just spent the last, you know, 40, 40 plus minutes talking about how, uh, 
um, you know, how do we get uh, training into the hands of event uh, developers? You know, how do we get security training into their hands? But I think there's also a, a re, you know, a requirement for for us to learn about um, about the technology uh, just as much as we're learning about security. So I think, you know, and it, when you mentioned CPEs, I kind of triggered that thought that it's like, yeah, that's right. You know, like what it, what about CPEs for uh, for us security folks to learn about develop, you know, the latest development practices and, and the latest, you know, cloud uh, offerings and things like that, where, you know, those kind of things, we have to be able to meet developers where they are. Um, and I think if we're not speaking their language, then we're, you know, we're, we're not, we're not doing them any favors. So. Yeah, I agree. And I, I get some pushback on this sometime, but I am a strong believer. If you're an AppSec engineer, you at a minimum should know how to write fluently in one language. Like at a minimum, I don't care, pick Python. That's everyone's Swiss army knife they go to, but learn, like, like, like learn one language. Cause if you don't understand how a functions are actually doing the things, how to build a service, how to do these fundamental tasks, how an API really works. Cause you've actually built one and you actually understand the concept behind it makes you so much more powerful when you're having these conversations with the engineer team. And to be honest, it helps you out. Like when I read a vulnerability on a scanning tool, I don't just read it and pull up the CVE and say, oh, it says to do X, Y, Z here. No, I read it and then I can comprehend, oh, wait, is this really a threat? How are we seeing this? I can do that that phase of refining the responses before I give them to development teams and have them have to come back and say, no, that's not something we want to fix, right? Us owning that load is a huge help to get buy-in for security. It goes back to make security as simple as possible, people will adopt it. All right, well, we're kind of coming to the end of this conversation. Do you have any other tips or tricks, the experience about security champion programs you want to share with our audience before we kind of close it out? No, you know, I for for those that are, uh, you know, starting on a, on a champions type uh, program, I, I think it's important to to really understand what it is it that you want that champions team to do. Um, build that out before, you know, you go and, and, uh, you know, start, start picking who you want on the team, right. Or, or start asking for who you want on the team. Um, you need to know what they're going to, what they're going to do, right. Is it, <clears throat> are they just going to be responsible for security within the team? Okay. Well then what does that mean? Are they doing secure code reviews? Are they doing threat models? Are they, um, ensuring that the scanning tools are ru uh, running? Are they assigning vulnerabilities to people? Are they reviewing those vulnerabilities? Like all those things need to be fleshed out before you start figuring out like who's going to be on that team. Right. You know, to me, that's, that's step one. Like, what do you want them to do? Once you know what you want them to do, make sure that they have the tools to do those things. Um, I think one of the challenges that, uh, we have, uh, in some organizations with, with building security, uh, security champions teams is that you say, okay, go, you know, you need to go threat model or, or, you know, you need to do secure code reviews or something like that. And, but we don't equip them with the, the means to do that, you know, and, and maybe we give them an, uh, a half a day training on threat modeling and maybe we, you know, throw a, the OWASP, uh, you know, se uh, secure code review book at them and say, here, just use this stuff. Um, but I think, you know, it, it's, it's making sure that you know what you want and make sure that they're equipped to do what it is that you want them to do. And I think also with the champions, make sure you have, you know, KPIs, OKRs, and, and make sure that you have um, goals in mind for how you're going to ensure that it, that team's being effective. Um, because, you know, I, I think that um, recently in the past couple of years, what I've really been trying to push for in most of my app, AppSec uh, uh, work is, is, you know, we need to measure, you know, how we're doing um, and, you know, adding more scanning tools and getting more vulnerabilities is not a measurement of our success. What's a measurement of our success is seeing fewer vulnerabilities, right? You know, because, you know, adding more tools, but seeing fewer vulnerabilities, because that means that we're getting further left. We're tuning our tools appropriately. We're getting uh, more education to the uh, developer's hands and, and they're producing fewer vulnerabilities. So I think, you know, we we need to get to a point where we're measuring the success of of you know champions teams and appsec teams um, to ensure that we're we're providing the right amount of value. 
I, I love that because a uh, huge fan of measure what matters. Um, and I think we do that great in things like engineering tasks and other stuff. I don't think we do it great on security all the time. Sometimes I think we pick areas that are like, well, we had, and I'll use training because it's my bias space, but we had 100 people watch videos on this vulnerability. So like, like check mark, like, well, that's, Watching videos isn't what matters. Right. I want to see a reduction of injection vulnerabilities being caught by my SaaS tools. Right. I want to see, like, I want to see the results that matter towards the organization. And yeah. sometimes for security, that's the hardest part for us, especially when you talk about champion programs. And I love the idea because I'm a huge fan of KPIs just in general, like, and on a way to approach problems. I think that's a great concept because I don't think anyone's really said to me, KPIs for your security champions so we can measure their effectiveness. Like that's right. that's a great approach to really to, to take and really show some value behind the work that's getting done. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Derek, I want to thank you for jumping on and having this amazing conversation with us. I think that a lot of our listeners are going to get a lot of value of this. Anybody that gets a chance, go get this book, read the Application Security Program Hand Guide. It's an amazing way to bring these ideas together. And if you're looking to start a program or you have a, a already have a program, it's definitely worth the read to make sure that you're kind of in tune with a lot of the things that everybody else is doing. Yeah, thank you, Mike. I appreciate the time. Awesome. So, and to all our guests, thank you for joining me for another episode of the Security Champions Podcast. Make sure you join me for the next episode where I'll meet with another security or engineer expert in the field, and we will discuss everything security-related and security champions. And never forget, security is a journey, not a destination.